Hello, welcome to the Exeta webinar on validating the results of an FMEDA. FMEDA is a process created to generate several very important reliability and safety metrics for components, devices, all the way up through systems. But we often have to ask, well, how do we know these are good predictions? Do we have good, credible results? Well, in this webinar, we're going to be talking about the three primary methods for, that Exeter uses to keep, to do a, as good a job as we can on validation of the FMEDA results. And you are welcome to use these techniques as well. As a note, slide handouts will be provided and this webinar recording will be available on the Exeter website. And I checked this morning and the first five in the webinar series are available. This is number seven in the Exeter Spring 2023 FMEDA webinar series. We've had a lot of fun, we hope you've been able to watch many of these and we hope we've been able to give you some valuable information. My name is Bill Goebel. I was a co-founder of Exeter uh, back in uh, early 2000 and I'm very proud that we've grown from the two co-founders all the way up to a large global company. We call ourselves a knowledge company. People turn to Exeter for the guidance, tools, and certification needed for functional safety, alarm management, and cybersecurity. The webinar is being brought to you today by one of our business units, the Exeter Innovation LLC. Uh, this group uh, develops engineering level software. There's a suite for systems level work called Excellentia, which is primarily for the machine and process industries, and a second suite called OEMX, which is for the purpose of streamlining the work process in, embed in new product development. Now, FMEDAX tool is part of the OEMX suite. If you've watched before, you know what a failure mode effects and diagnostic analysis is. But for those who come the first time, I'll just repeat a wee bit. FMEDA is a bottom-up inductive approach to quantitatively predict failure rates and failure modes and a number of important other reliability mechanisms. If you look at the outputs of an FMEDA, you will see a lot of things that people really have been struggling to uh, get data on. Now, an FMEDA tool should absolutely have at least some automatic error checking. And perhaps you can program your spreadsheet to put in some error checking. But beyond that, what should we do to validate FMEDA results? Well, one of the oldest techniques is called a fault injection test. Now, a fault injection test, we simulate a component failure, typically with a soldering iron or a knife or a set of needle nose tweezers. We simulate component shorts, component opens, current leakage. Um, we, we use other tools to simulate bit errors and so forth, which I'll explain to you shortly. Each fault injection test is done to validate a particular line on the FMEDA. So keeping that in mind, you would commonly specify a set of fault injection tests for two purposes. Number one, 
test to make sure each automatic diagnostic claimed has been implemented and a sample of other failures when there was perhaps some doubt as to what would happen when that component fails in that mode or you simply wanted to verify that what you what you predicted is accurate now this could be a very time consuming process but imagine a a device with 200 components and and uh, about five automatic diagnostic functions well you would certainly pick five for the automatic diagnostic functions and and maybe another five or 10 so somewhere in the range of 10 to 15 fault injections and that's not too bad that can easily get done maybe in a half day, worst case, a whole day, if there's a lot of setup. Of course, it does depend if you burn out the circuit board with a little bit of carelessness, but with, with good planning and careful sequencing, you can get through a fault injection test in a few hours. As an example, and these fault injection tests work. As an example, after an FMEDA, a fault injection test was performed to verify that the RAM, the random access memory test automatic diagnostic was properly implemented. And after a fault injection was done via a, a, a simulator connected to a JTAG port, nothing happened. We injected a bad bit, which should have simulated a memory fault and this alleged automatic diagnostic did not work. The manager of the department, of course, uh, of course the test failed. It was, it was uh, very unpleasant uh, for that development team. Manager traced the problem down to a last minute compilation. After the first fault, after this test was done once, a last minute compilation to speed up execution by setting the optimizing compiler up one level. The optimizing compiler looked at the code, save a byte to a temporary location, set all the bits, clear the bits, return the original value. And it concluded that that section of code could be eliminated. <laughs> And it was a major with this major diagnostic missing, of course, uh, the project failed the final certification audit, and uh, it was a sad, uh, quite sad for the development team because they had to go back and do some redesign work. Fault injection testing does work, and sometimes you get a surprise result, but I'll have to admit most of the time, all the tests pass the FMEDA results are verified, validated. Validation method number two, compare to a public database for a similar device. And we're, we're at Exeter, we, we use the SILSAFE database. And I'll ex take a look at the chart. We see what that looks like. You see that for any given device type, which are listed on the left-hand side. There's an upper bound and a lower bound on the dangerous undetected failure rate. So we can compare the dangerous undetected from the FMEDA, and it really should be within those limits. Now, why do we say that? <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you. <laughs> It's, it works for mechanical and electronic devices. The SILSAFE data limits come from a combination of field failure data and a design strength analysis based on a large number of FMEDAs for a particular device type. Now, I'll explain. FMEDA is an analysis of product design strength. 
in a given environmental and design stress environment. Now you've 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 looked at the stress strength concept previously if you've watched our previous webinars. So you understand the concept. Key point, FMEDA analysis of 50 or 100 different designs will show the spread of design. How much variation do we get because of change in design? So we do a statistical analysis of all of these uh, FMEDAs. And I mean, we, we, we look at the statistical analysis. We go plus and minus two sigma. At least we look at the plus and minus three sigma. And but we pick a number between plus and minus two sigma and three sigma guided by other failure rate data. What other failure rate data? Well, we have a lot of data coming in from, from uh, other uh, data collection sources. Uh, even the SILSTAT program from Exeter. We pick upper and lower bounds. If your FMEDA does not fall within those bounds, I admit it's theoretically possible, but you really have to go back and check and make certain. Maybe you gave way too much credit for an automatic diagnostic. Um, maybe there's just a problem in your component reliability database. But whatever, we find our results match up with the upper lower bounds of SIL safe data. Validation mechanism number three, manufacturers field return studies. Now, you're probably screaming right now, what are you talking about? That data is of no value. Well, uh, it, it is a, 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 it does have value. However, it's absolutely never to be used for SIF verification because of a number of limits to the usage. And it all has to do with what a, the lack of information in a manufacturer field return system. A manufacturer has no idea how many failures have been returned. I've seen this over and over again. One manufacturer even claimed that all field failures were repaired by uh, his personnel. Therefore, he had a 100% count. Uh, but we did a survey of a number of end users, discovered that several of his end users did not use his group to do the field failures uh, repair. Not all failures are counted in the manufacturer's field return system because the incoming inspection test does not test at oper normal operating conditions. And many manufacturers have defined failure um, to exclude all user abuse. And actually they are real, they are real failures. And the manufacturer doesn't really know the actual operating hours. So with all these problems, how can we possibly use this to help validate an FMEDA? Well, we ask for shipping records and return information. We prefer the raw, the raw failure reports or perhaps even a summary of them. We can't really accept uh, data that's already been analyzed because of the, uh, the things I just told you about. We assume a product will not go into operation until at least six months after it was shipped. We assume a percentage of time is spent every year uh, due to downtime is, is spent every year due to repairs and or testing. 
we choose a return failure return rate assumption depending on the cost of the device and the manufacturer's warranty policy. And we usually pick a number 10, 50, or 70%, never go over 70. If a manufacturer has a really good warranty uh, program, and it's a very expensive part, we think it'll probably be in the range of 70. Uh, so we will take a look at that. Then we will vary the assumptions to get our upper and lower bound. Now we use a spreadsheet. We calculate a point estimate. We calculate, we use either a 70 or 90% confidence factor for statistical analysis using a chi-squared algorithm. And the numbers we get, the, the, the confidence interval numbers are higher than the point estimate, that's for sure. That's, that's the way the statistics are, although that all depends on how many failures there have been. And we compare that, those numbers to the FMEDA prediction. Typically, the return data calculation is much lower than the FMEDA results. Uh, often the, even the 90% confidence, upper bound confidence estimate is significantly lower than FMEDA. But we do, and that's exactly what we expect. Now, sometimes if, if things look a little strange or it gets a little too close, we'll do a worst case upper bound by counting all the failures, every single return as a failure. We might estimate a much lower return rate and then do the calculation again. Then we assume 100%, that's upper bound. Lower bound will assume optimistic parameters do the calculation again and we often find the FMEDA is between the warranty return um, upper bound confidence factor estimates and our worst case upper bound uh, calculation. The value of the manufacturer's data is that it is real failure data about the product we are trying to analyze or about one from that manufacturer that's very similar, like the preceding model. Here's an example. You can see we've been given a list of failures categorized according to failure type. Now this is, this is a pretty good arrangement here. Um, and we've been, we had the number of units shipped and we estimated operating hours based on our assumptions uh, for the last three years. Sometimes we get more detail, sometimes we get less. We try to, we, we pick pessimistic numbers and we look through this. Well, 48 of the returns are no fault found. Hmm, that's typical. So at minimum, we're going to count 100 failures. At maximum, we're going to count 188 failures. So let's start with our spreadsheet. We, what we will do the lower number first, 100 failures reported. We assume 70% because this was a very expensive logic, high power logic solver. If 70% of the failures were returned. The estimate of the actual numbers is 143. We get a point estimate of um, 12,030 fits. If we apply the confidence interval at 70%, we get a upper confidence limit failure rate of, well, it's, it's, it's 1,280, it's 12, 1,287 fits, and we compare that to the FMEDA data of 2,289 fits. So the manufacturer's number is not quite half of the FMEDA, and that is very common and very normal and makes perfect sense to us. 
since there's so many assumptions in the manufacturer's data that um, that's and by experience we know that's that's what we uh, that's what we have learned to trust it's not a bad method and lastly don't forget that your tools have error checking built into them a good tool has a number of error checking methods uh, like this this uh, these lines in the results from FMEDAX, over allocated and under allocated should be zero. If any number is there, any other number is there, an error has been made. The quality of an FMEDA can be validated by one or more techniques. We've told you about fault injection, data comparison with published charts data comparison with failure data from the manufacturer, or even comparison with previous FMEDA work. With, I think fault injection testing is one of the best of the validation methods because it does pretty clearly validate individual line results in the FMEDA, and it can certainly validate that the claimed automatic diagnostics have been implemented. Those are both very important things to verify because your FMEDA predictions have the automatic diagnostic coverage built in. Lastly, error checking is common in most commercial FMEDA tools, which help us all very much. Well, if anyone has any questions or comments, I've got the question window open, and I can answer a few questions right now. Let me remind you that the slides will be available, and the recording of this session is also going to be available within a few days.